So you layer all these insertion technologies to create a fabric. And then the kicker is the framework that binds them together has algorithms in it that give you a score, a confidence score for that data based on how much trust insertion technology you add. So you can literally create data in the in the physical world or it goes through a trust fabric and then it scores it and it says, hey, I'm 80% confident that this data is real. And then as part of that metadata, you say, I'm, I'm willing to sell this information. This information is private to me. You send it out into the, the wild and then people can buy it, share it, whatever, based on those terms. And they know how real is it. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today on the show, we have Jason Shepard. Jason is an entrepreneurial technology leader with a unique combination of technical and creative abilities, including driving strategy, managing R&D teams, business development, and engaging in outbound marketing. Jason is currently VP of Ecosystem at Edge Orchestration Company, Zedida. Prior to joining Zedida, Jason was CTO for the Dell Technologies Edge and IoT Solutions Division. Jason is also governing board chair for LF Edge, and was recognized as one of the top 100 industrial IoT influencers in both 2018 and 2019. He holds over 40 granted and pending U.S. patents as well. So congratulations. Thank you, Jason, for being uh, on the show with us today. No, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on, uh, Justin. And it's it's funny, like you got Zadita pronounced uh, right, because a lot of people say Zadita and they're asked, well, how does it pronounce? And I said, oh, well, think of a Run DMC song like my Zadita. Oh, nice. <laughs> Well, I did a little bit of research before this uh, show here, too, so I was able to get it right. Well, I'm super excited to talk about artificial intelligence and AI at the edge and everything like that during this episode. I will know we'll touch on that. But first, I, I usually like to dig in a little deeper. I gave a little bit of background on yourself, kind of maybe have our guests talk a little bit about how they got into where they're at today and what was your path that, that brought you to, uh, you know, being VP of uh, Ecosystem. Yeah, I'm a mechanical engineer from school. So I went to school for mechanical engineering. I started designing sheet metal and plastic enclosures uh, at Dell early career. And and then after a couple of years, I went to the startup world. And that's where you start wearing a lot of different hats. And uh, one of my favorite mantras is the best way to get a job is to already be doing it. So you just kind of dive in. And so over the years, I started to kind of purposely get more and more towards the solutioning side of things, uh, software, you started running R&D teams and hiring software folks in at, at that point at Dell when I had gone back and just kind of started evolving that way. And then in 2014, we started this effort within a CTO org that I was part of at, at Dell. I was like, hey, what, what do we want to do with IoT, this buzzword IoT? And you know, how we got part of the reason we got it funded from an infrastructure standpoint is I just went out and started building ecosystem partnerships, ISVs that needed infrastructure. So that turned into a whole business there. Then, you know, ultimately I, you know, I got a project called EdgeX Foundry started, you know, with a small team there that just hit seven million downloads out in Linux Foundation. So, you know, it's all about building this network effect. And so just over the years, I uh, left Dell as a CTO for Edge and IoT and came to Zadita because it got to the point that if uh you replaced Dell with Zadita on all my thought leadership material. It read the same. I called up our CEO. I was like, I should come work for you. And, and then we're, you know, I'm like, I'm CTO now, but at the same time in the Valley, CTO is a little ivory tower. It's all about ecosystem. This is the era of the ecosystem. So that's how I ended up here. Excellent. Well, very cool. Well, you talked about uh, EdgeX um, and the, Edge, the EdgeX founder. You want to define that a little bit? Yeah. So EdgeX Foundry, this was basically how do I drive more interoperability? at the edge, you know, from an IoT perspective, uh, no secret, there's way too many IoT platforms. You know, when we started in 2004, I mean, you know, the market, like in 2014, there was like, the joke was there's 100 IoT platforms, and then it was 300 platforms, and then 450. And we knew back in 2015, that the market was going to go vertical before horizontal. So the, the people that were laser focused on one use case, because it's first and foremost about use cases, they'll get traction. The big players will spin for a bit, trying to own everything. And then around the time that people feel enough pain to realize, oh, we need open interoperability with domain knowledge on top and, and necessarily unique hardware and software, then EdgeX that we've gotten started with these sort of cloud-native principles at the yeah. edge, because everyone was being you know, really embedded in their thinking, 
as things evolved, like around the time EdgeX got mature, people started to kind of dive in. I started with the team at Dell in 2015. I had this epiphany driving in California. I'm like on the magical mystery tour, I call it, trying to meet all these you know startups and who's got the right you know edge strategy and, and then you know IoT. And we just didn't see any architectures that were built with the modularity to bring together an ecosystem. So I called up my team at Dell and I said, hey, you know, the CTO team said, hey, if, if I got some funding, what if we did this? And that's how it started. We launched it into Linux Foundation in 2017. Interestingly, so, you know, I talk about that maturity curve. 2017 to 2019, there were like 300,000 downloads of those containers within Linux Foundation. So the first two years, 300,000. The next year, 6.7 million. So it's this curve of like, I got it all figured out. I'm going to own everything to, oh man, this is really hard. <laughs> we need to focus on more open interoperability. And so that's that's EdgeX, a you know, huge community that's building it. So you know, certainly not just me, but I, I help kind of seed it with the team. And Eve OS, which is the base of the Zadita Foundation, it's a sister project within LF Edge, within Linux Foundation. And so part of the reason I chose to come to Zadita was I'm very passionate about open. My next big project was around trust fabrics. It'd be good to talk about those. But you know, I mean, just looking forward into the future, the real potential is interconnected ecosystems driving new business models, new experiences, and you will never, ever get there without open. You know, imagine if the internet was closed. And so very passionate about that. So long story short, that's that's kind of the trajectory that I've been on for about five years you know, in terms of building the, the strategy on top of itself. Very cool. No, you're, you're talking to a, a huge open source advocate here, both in hardware and in software. So I, I love the Arduino platform. Is it beautiful that somebody created this back in, you know, in Italy 15 years ago or whatever, and they've sort of open sourced it and been able to continue to let people build and do some pretty cool prototypes all the way to just the Apache Foundation, right? I mean, everything that Apache is built on is really, really amazing. So great to hear that you were a part of sort of getting this thing set up. So you, so you got this EdgeX Foundry going, kicking ass at Dell, doing all that type of stuff. And then was there a piece of that then that moved you into working at Zadata? You said that it was there was some sort of underlying same technology? Different technologies. So our, our, you know, we're about, uh, but, but very complementary. So we're about orchestration for distributed edge computing. So that's like, you know, I know you work in, in kind of deeply embedded stuff. The beauty of when you have enough memory on a box, you can abstract things through VMs and containers. That layer of abstraction greatly simplifies your life. You kind of have this below that, whatever hardware you want, above that, whatever apps you want, VMs, containers, clusters, you name it. Evo OS, our foundation that our cloud, our subscription-based cloud uses from a Linux foundation, think of it as Android for the edge. Very opinionated stack. It's not just Linux, just like Android is not just Linux. It's got an embedded hypervisor in it. But that community is curating that operating system that's got this embedded hypervisor and all these security things that go down into the silicon. And that runs down to about 512 megs of memory and two cores. That's the base. x86, ARM, GPUs, FPGAs, doesn't matter. Once you can pay that tax with memory and you can kind of bridge it up to the fringes of the data center, once you pay that tax, your life is greatly simplified because all you care about is containerizing or put in a VM and you're done. You don't have to think about hardware anymore. Same thing with the hardware makers don't have to think about skewing up individual SKUs for every app that they want to ship. It's exactly like the Android ecosystem. You create a base, you start building a ecosystem of hardware and software around it and do it in an open way and then it scales. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Android. They had their Android things, you know, thing that they just canned, I guess, recently. I actually was a longtime Android developer. I was one of the first people in line. I built a lot of apps over my career. Any thoughts on maybe why they did that? It feels like, well, it's a very Google thing to do is to start projects and then just end them. Yeah, you know, Android is a, it's a great ecosystem. It's a solved problem in the mobile space. But, you know, I just don't think that you can slap that into a, a, this different kind of more edge continuum. Just It's a different thing. Headless devices, whole different set of considerations. When you don't have a user associated with with every device, it's different. Like no one's there to be like, hey, my email is acting wiggy. You maybe don't open this. And the consumer world, like, you know, if you're working you know, in an enterprise, IT can just shut down the network if there's a breach. Sorry, you can't get to your Facebook or your sports scores or whatever, like, or do your work. But in the OT world, things go boom. You know, the operations world, things go boom if there's a hack. And, and the other benefit, though, in the operations world or IoT is that you can be super oppressive on devices and no one's going to, uh, they're not going to complain back. You know, from a security standpoint. But yeah, I, I just think it's it was trying to apply a tool to a market that it's just not suited for. It, the benefit of Android is the ecosystem behind it, and they, they hit it at the right time. When you need an alternative to the curation of, of iOS, 
I mean, let's face it, there's a reason why, I mean, I've spoken from someone with AirPods and an iPhone, but iOS has like 20% of the market share globally. Android has 80, as you probably know. So uh, as I say, open builds a bigger stage for a better show. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned trust fabrics a little bit at the beginning, I guess. And since we're talking about things at the edge, maybe define what that is and, and some of the positives of being a part of this. Yeah. So after we, you know, we got Edgex going, the community kind of took off. The next big effort that I, I helped lead when I was at Dell and, and still you know, kind of diving back in, that was part of the beauty, of, the beauty of open source. You can work on it from anywhere. We started this thing around trust fabric. So, um, you know, and how do you build data confidence, you know, across networks? One of the challenges, well, first off in IOT or any, any kind of market, it has nothing to do with technology. The top two challenges are use case and people, whether it's, you know, the consumer, the operations person, the IT person, the line of business, things like not my job that scares me. I don't have the skills. These are, this is the why IOT has taken so long to take off balancing the privacy that you need with the value that you get. And so the notion behind trust fabrics is when you have these complex, you know, increasingly interconnected ecosystems, getting beyond intranets of things to more of a true internet of things, you have to automate trust. You can't take people out to dinner fast enough one by one to build trust globally at scale. You know, just you need technology's help. And no, it's not just about blockchain. A trust fabric as we conceived it, and I worked with senior fellows, a, a guy named Steve Todd, you really helped a lot on this. And then we brought in other people you know, at Dell Technologies. But a trust fabric is a system level approach to building trust across networks. The framework binds all this together. And it's manifest in this project called Alvarium that, that we launched a little over a year ago. And it's incubating. Uh, you can find it at alvarium.org. There's a cool video that I produced with my team at, at Dell before leaving that kind of shows the future of all these interconnected ecosystems through these trust fabrics. You start at Silicon, you do open API frameworks, you know, like an EdgeX or, you know, anything. You add confidential computing, immutable storage technologies, AI for, for context and different things. Ledger technologies just keep track of stuff. They don't tell you whether it's quality. So you layer all these insertion technologies to create a fabric. And then the kicker is the framework that binds them together has algorithms in it that give you a score, a confidence score for that data based on how much trust insertion technology you add. So you can literally create data in the, in the physical world or whatever. It goes through a trust fabric and then it scores it and it says, hey, I'm 80% confident that this data is real. And then as part of that metadata, you say, I'm willing to sell this information. This information is private to me. You send it out into the, the wild and then people can buy it, share it, whatever, based on those terms. And they know how real is it. You know, this is important as you get into all these deep fakes with AI and all that. If I'm a nuclear plant, I probably care about 100% confidence. But, you know, if I'm a home, if it's turning on my lights in my house, you know, I'm good with 70% or whatever, you know, just you know, example. But trust is going to be one of the next big things. I mean, you got to get basics going. But then to really scale into the true potential, you have to automate trust. You know, that's what these are about. For sure. The internet in general, I, I like to sort of tell the story. I mean, think about when it first got started. To me, it was just, a, I built a lot of websites. So it was just a lot of brochureware. So it was just basically people being able to take a look at information. Then you kind of had this phase of where you had the Facebooks and the blogging and all that type of stuff. So you had people sort of sharing. So now they're producing content. They're not just consuming, but they're also producing it. And the internet of things really is now machines talking to machines. And so, you know, if I were to pull up your, your blog, for example, Jason, I'd be like, oh, I know this guy. I trust him. I'll trust what I read. But machines can't do that, right? They, they have to be able to, to, to validate the APIs that they're calling against or the other things that they're getting data, pushing data, transactional data, all that stuff needs to be able to be trusted. And having something on the blockchain, you're right, is sort of, okay, that gives us a record in time that this happened, but you still don't really have a whole lot of validity with regards to these machines. And when you have 50 billion IoT devices, you know, on the internet in the next five years, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, for sure. So, so on one hand, an IoT device or a thing or whatever, if it's pulling data from the physical world, as long as you can trust it, it's fact. As long as it's reliably sensing and it's trustworthy, it's fact. Versus, you know, people can make up all kinds of stuff. And we haven't seen that at all. You know, surely, you know, <laughs> A lot of crazy stuff going on around there. And then, of course, the, the AI-enabled deep fakes and stuff. It's, it's freaky stuff. So that's the benefit of machines. But at the same time, if you can't trust them, then there's a whole other problem, especially given the scale factor. You know, It used to be that 
fraud would happen through someone that's automating emails, you know, like the, the prince in Egypt that you know, wants to send you $10 million. But now if you start getting into AI and machines, I mean, there's just massive, massive scale potential for bad stuff to happen. So you have to start building the ability to combat AI with AI and, and really understand the trust factor. It's just a really important topic. And, you know, the vision that's in that video at alvarium.org is, is further out, but you're going to start seeing, I think, these pockets of, you know, kind of trusted relationships form, and then it starts to expand. And there's also in that video, there's a reason why we put a service provider in the middle of, it's got like vignettes from like smart homes and manufacturing and energy and stuff. Everything's interconnected in the end. As long as you get value, you're willing to give up a little privacy. Five years ago, I'm like, hey, guys, you know, we're not going to do IoT for consumer. Amazon's going to win. Calling it right now. Why? Because I sell content and more importantly, stuff. And I've built a relationship with that consumer over years. Like I, I know my UPS driver by first name. And so in the consumer world, people's trust revolves around large companies, large entities, or just any entity that you trust. And you'll give up some privacy to get value. But to scale across B to B to C or X to X to X, you cannot have one company own the trust. And that's why this whole concept is around decentralize it and make it into these fabrics. You have your circle of trust. Uh, important also is a trust fabric is not one version. You assemble it from the ingredients, however it makes sense to you. If you use open source for everything, most transparent, it's probably going to drive higher confidence scores. Say you replace one component with a commercial thing, maybe the confidence goes down until that's trusted. Uh, it's exactly like a circle of trust with people. It's like you get a new person, they look a little, you know, you don't know them. You're, you're going to kind of hold back some information until you get to know them. It's mimicking human trust circles. Which on a conceptual level, everybody understands. That's kind of what you said. Now, now can these new fabrics, can you have multiple subfabrics? Yeah, that's all intent. So. Say I'm a business, I build technologies uh, throughout my networks you know, that I own. I, I've built this fabric. I've got these different layers. That creates a context around the confidence of data passing through my fabric. Say it's a supply chain. There's another supplier that has their setup, and it's, it can be different again. And, and it, we just have to agree through open collaboration what these algorithms are. And that's the whole point of you know, getting it out into the wild and you know, build standards around it. If my fabric does this kind of confidence and mine does this, when they intersect, it creates a normalization effect. And then you come up with an intermediate confidence score. And so it's, it's based on these, it's a little abstract, but it's based on these complex relations. And the exact same thing happens in the business world. My organization has a certain level of trust among my people. Yours does. We get together. We're a little standoffish at first and trying to figure, and then we, you reach a boundary condition. And so the same thing will happen with this stuff. Very cool. Yeah. I, you were like a, a no, nodes on a network, right? And there's, Obviously, something that's going to bridge that divide between all these nodes. And maybe, and that's, that's what you're saying, I guess, if you have two different organizations, they obviously need to agree on some place to meet in the middle, but that does happen in these trust fabric. Yeah, that's the concept. So there's some stuff at alvarium.org, and you know, I know we should probably touch on some other top, but so Dell, I brought in IOTA, the IOTA Foundation, one of the, you know, I think leading, they're doing some really interesting stuff with their Tangle protocol. Um, but it could be any ledger, but you know, we, we had started with IOTA. So Dow, IOTA, and Intel recently did a podcast or a webinar on it, like as an update for the project and, and a lot of interest in it. So you can find that online, you know, uh, just cool stuff. And, and so we're working on incubating it and you know, stay tuned, but definitely a very important conversation you know, for the future, just the trust one in, in general. Yeah, I, I publish like liner notes with each one of these episodes. So I'll be sure and include links off to some of these things as well. Now, when we're talking about these networks and stuff working at the edge, obviously there's compute going on. And, you know, I typically like to ask people, you know, how would they define, you know, AI in general? But I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you, would you define edge AI? First off, AI in general, it's obviously very, very important emerging space. And, you know, things are accelerating, it seems like by the day. But then there's a lot of people still talking about AI as like, oh, I do AI. And it's really just like a fancy, if this, then that rolls engine. <laughs> like, no, 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 you don't do AI. So clearly a lot of this cool stuff happening. Edge AI is basically, it's typically inferencing. You know, so you're training in the cloud and then you push uh, some sort of inferencing model down closer to the action. We are seeing a trend towards federated learning where you're, you're kind of seeing a blend, even training at the edge, but then you could get regional bias. So you know, in the purest sense, it's training in the cloud and, and you deploy inferencing model out in the field. The edge is a continuum. There isn't a single one. It's from very, very constrained devices all the way up through sort of regional and access data centers. There's actually a pretty good paper within LF Edge, uh, the taxonomy paper we put out last year that describes Edge 
in great detail based on inherent technical trade-offs and not loaded terms like near, far, thin and thick and all that. It's like, is it latency critical? You're always going to run on-prem, so here's the on-prem user edge. Is it latency sensitive, but you want to skip to lots of people, you're going to run it at the service provider. So it's the LAN or LAN. You'll never deploy your airbag over a WAN, no matter how fast your, your 5G is. There's a lot of people saying, oh, you're going to drive your car from the cloud because it's 5G. I'm like, you're insane. It's not going to happen. Now, augmenting with, with services around augmented reality, you know, uh, infotainment, sure. You know, are you in a physically secure data center or are you not? Very different security implications. Are you so constrained that you must be embedded, you know, kind of are going into Arduino and beyond? Or are you able to abstract it? And that's based on memory. And so Zadita, as an example, our edge is from that lowest limit, 512 megs and two cores you know, with EVOS from LF Edge up to the data center. But we're not in any way trying to compete with VMware, Nutanix. Those are solved problems. We are seeing Kubernetes come down and we're meeting it. So Edge AI, it's you know, about just deploying it across the continuum, generally inferencing a lot of the large infrastructure players will, will say, oh, everything happens in the data center. AI is happening on servers in the data center because it's basically it's what they sell. As you know, there's a lot of tiny ML spinning up, you know, machine learning like on very, very slim devices, fixed function, but it's happening everywhere. I've said for a while, fixed is the new mobile. People talk about ambient compute, but you know, you see more compute everywhere embedded. In many ways, IoT is embedded computing hitting scale. So it's interesting stuff, but yeah, it's inferencing some training at the edge. I, I joke, it's like deep learning in the back and shallow learning at the edge, but yeah, mostly inferencing today. Gotcha. What would you describe as some of the biggest challenges, I guess, that are going on with Edge AI? First, it's use case. I mean, a lot of people chatting. A computer vision is the, the, the killer app for, for Edge AI. Unless you sell wide area connectivity, you do not think it's a good idea to stream 4K video over the internet. Deploying in the real world, so say you're talking computer vision, what works in a lab with you know, cameras and lighting and angles doesn't always translate into the real world. Just scaling models. I mean, I'm working on various different you know, AI consortia efforts, and everyone's talking about, oh, AI and the models and all this cool stuff. When they get to actually deploying in the real world, it's like, oh, that's hard. And so that's, I mean, that's what Zadita does. But, um, so, so we think that's a big part of it. I think one of the big challenges with Edge AI, and in general, is that when you get out into the field, there's highly diverse use cases, but then also skill sets, more importantly. The people that understand certain industry domains are not the same people that understand data science. And so you have to kind of span the, the gap. When it comes to AI models for things like object detection, is that a car, is that a bicycle, is that a gun or a weapon, you know, uh, whatever, that's going to become commodity over time. I mean, it already kind of is. There's no differentiation long term. There's going to be a set of models that everyone uses. Over time, the real value for AI or any of these technologies is going to be people that program models for very specific contexts or get into the deep, you know, the, the tiny ML, which is not easy with constrained devices. But I know how this factory runs and I'm going to work with someone, you know, that does data science and we're going to develop models specifically for this. This was a colleague at, at Dell that had worked on this zero downtime factory initiative for robots. And there was this guy named Brad that was on the floor, had been there for like years. And he knew just based on gut feel, like if it looks like that, that's bad. If it looks like that, don't worry about it. And so they had brought data scientists in and Brad consulted with the data scientists and, and they created these models and they called it Bradalytics, you know, in the, end, <laughs> in the end. But that's one of the challenges is understanding specific contexts, deploying it in the real world, all that kind of stuff is the reality. If you're in the data center and you're centralized and you have the right skill sets, not that it's trivial by any means, but it's just a lot easier. It's a lot easier than having to manage these 10,000 devices out in the field and having them do the right thing at the right time, dealing with physical. That's the thing is, I mean, got boy sensors can be wonky, right? And you can have different lighting conditions, like you mentioned, temperature can affect some of this stuff, you know, as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a much different world when you have the physical meeting the digital out there. Yeah, I mean, AI in the back end, say I'm, I'm doing things, you know, that are uh, analyzing long-term trends. You know, it's financial trends, you know, it could be medical collaboration. No one's going to die if it goes down right then. Your vehicle doing using AI for, for augmented or uh, autonomous driving, you're going to have some problems if that fails. 
any issue in the operations world, in the physical world, causes immediate loss to production and potentially life. Any issue in the IT world has massive scale over a long period of time. I've said for a while, like IoT starts in OT and scales in IT. Uh, IT has just a different perspective you know, or a different you know, scale factor. But that's another, it was Edge AI, I said, if, you, if something goes wrong or you get it wrong, it's going to impact production or safety right now. Yeah, well said. Are you seeing that a lot of companies still don't get it? I mean, to me, it feels like this is kind of a, duh, of course you should be doing it. And I feel like as I talk to more and more companies, or as I've talked to companies over the past, you know, 10 years or so, they're just kind of stuck in their ways, right? They, they, don't, they don't think that these things need to be built intelligently. Um, Zadita, obviously, you guys have invested a lot of money and a lot of time, and a lot of effort sort of building out some really cool technology. But what, what's your general sense? Are, are people still, are we still another five years away from this really taking off? I think so. I mean, all new technologies are solutions looking for problems up front. And there's been great strides. And, and, and like I said, things are accelerating. But we have a lot of customers you know, that come to us. You know, they don't want to hear about edge and AI. They've got business problems. You know, And then these are tools to solve those problems. And the reality is, I mean, Zidia is great, great value. I wouldn't have come otherwise. I, just, I think we're doing something really important in the right amount of early because edge is becoming a hotter and hotter topic as more and more data is out there. And you, you just can't send everything central. A lot of customers, you know, the reality is they come to us and if they're early in their endeavor or whatever, like they don't get what we do. They're like, oh, you know, I, I can do all that. Like I, they care about apps and what's my app? And it usually it's like, come to me, don't understand it. You go tinker with apps and then you get past the POC and then you're like, holy crap, how do I scale this? Then they come back and, and they're really interested in the way we do it. And it's, you know, very flexible. But a lot of people are still kind of early there's also a lot of legacy thinking, as, as, as I think you, you said. People are kind of trapped, the innovator's dilemma, if you will. One of the big challenges in the market, you know, the way I summarize it, and, and people are having this struggle, you know, 400 IoT platforms, but most of them have never set their foot in a, in a factory floor, the developers. Oh, I can do AI, I can do all this stuff, but do you understand how machines really fail? No. That, again, that's that domain knowledge part. But there's a lot of challenges around established markets, the incumbents, people that have been around for a while, they have the channel, they have the relationships. Meanwhile, the challengers have the new technology and the incumbents rarely lead the charge into the new way of doing things. The challengers need the channel, the relationships, the incumbents need the new tech, and then, but then they're all like standoffish because like you're threatening me. And you have to bridge this gap too to solve problems. And that's part of the reason why, you know, from a Zadia standpoint, why we started with VMs first with the open source component, because we can support legacy apps and infrastructure right next to modern containers like AI. So take an example, in the safety and security market, video surveillance, large channels, people that know how to roll cameras, you know, drive camera, you know, trucks out, install cameras, no problem. If you're in the data center, like massive stadium or, or a school campus or whatever, you can afford like heavy data center stuff, all these cameras going through network switches to that stuff. If you're doing like a thousand McDonald's or something, the precedent today is I go out, I install a Windows-based video management software. It's all Windows-based today. I put it on a box, I connect the cameras, I leave and I never see it again. And so we're starting to work as Zadita with these, this channel hey, guys, you can do exactly what you do today, plop that Windows-based thing on whatever box you want. And then meanwhile, as you evolve, you can start dropping AI models on there to start doing facial recognition, license plate detection off that street. And it gives that transition path from legacy to modern. And that's important to bridge the challenge, the catch-22 that people are facing in the market. Interesting, for sure. And that's all with, with containerized models, right? Or containerized solutions? Yeah, yeah. So, well... EVOS, you know, this, the Android of the Edge that we, we contribute and now leverage, and a lot of people are using it, is supports both VMs and containers. You can drop on a VM with a Windows-based app or some Linux image, whatever, and then right next to it, drop a Docker container of an AI model. And that's really important thing. Most solutions today are starting with the container crate, but then you forget about all that legacy out there. Yeah, I mean, an organization that has thousands of cameras already or thousands of these boxes already out in the field, you're right. They need a slow path to it. Yeah. An example, I, I met with a lot of companies over the years and it, kind of that thing around around the innovator's dilemma. And I, I was meeting with a large payments processing company. It was around kind of IoT. They wanted to talk about IoT strategy. And, and it was pretty clear that they just they didn't know what to do. And they're like, oh, man, when Square came out for mobile devices, that really impacted us. We don't want another Square to happen. 
So we're having this conversation and it was just kind of spinning. And, and I had planned this before the end of the call. I said, you know, and I was, I, as I had to go, I'm like, hey, guys, have you thought about when machines start making payments? And that blew their minds. They're like, what? I didn't say this, but I'm, the fact that that blows your mind is why Square is going to happen to you again. You're not getting out in front and kind of redefining the problem or the, the opportunity, I guess, is another way to say. So I joke with some people that I say, you know, like one day you're going to come home and there's going to be a, a part for your for your furnace sitting there on your front step. And you're going to be like, I didn't know I, I didn't know I needed this. And it's going to be like, well, yeah, you did. Uh, the furnace knew that you were, the fan was about to die and it went ahead and ordered it for you. Right. And that's going to happen. And if companies aren't don't embrace that or understand that it's going to be all about uptime service and machines taking over a lot of these these mundane tasks, you're right. They're going to get left behind. They're going to get squared. And this, this comes back to the trust factor. To, to have this privacy value curve, get, getting a value of your privacy, you'll give up some. You know, I think that we haven't really faced some major privacy breaches where people use their own behavior. It's not just companies that have to be responsible for their people's privacy as people. But, you know, uh, a lot of people don't understand how much data is flowing around back out in the, the web about them, but the dark web, whatever. But, but to get to that where, okay, with, you know, my air conditioner to talk to some systems and trigger all those actions, I'm going to have to trust that whole supply chain back to the trust fabric thing, I think. But I totally agree that's going to happen. Advanced class for, so predictive maintenance, you know, hot topic. A lot of people talk about it, but then few people actually have the knowledge to go do it. But advanced class would be, I don't just know when that machine is going to fail. I know that if I'm going to send a tech out to this region, I'm going to make a route for all of the machines that I need to upgrade. And no, 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 don't fix that one. That one's near the end of its service life. Replace that one. And no, no, no. That kind of prescriptive analytics, it just keeps layering on top of itself. But, but I totally agree. This is where we're headed as long as you maintain the privacy value curve. Yes, for sure. Well, cool, man. We've, we've dug into a lot of some really interesting futuristic concepts and technology and stuff like that. I'm, I'm curious how you relax outside of your professional life. I, as we're doing this interview here, I can see through the virtualness that it looks like you're a musician, huh? Yeah, I know. This is my office by day, studio by night, or the other way around, depending on, you know, kind of working conditions. But yeah, I've been playing a long time. And I joke, so I live in Austin here in Texas, and it's a big music town. Oh, when you come here, they just give all this stuff to you. You want a guitar? You know, take another one. Here, here's a here's a drum kit. It's been great. Like over the just with crazy COVID times and just all the unfortunate stuff. My current band, we've been able to record remotely and got everyone set up. We've been releasing EPs and you know bonus tracks and all that all last year. So it's been fun. That's good. Do you have any particular instrument you like to play the most? I play guitar and sing. It's all my stuff. I could do a shameless plug. The band name is Bell Diver, and there's a lot of good stuff out there on on that. So belldiver.com, but um, really fun. We're kind of like along the lines of, you know, Wilco or Mumford and Sons, Lumineers, you know, some of our kind of replacements or things like that. So lyrically driven song, you know, kind of Americana type stuff. It's fun. It definitely helped us maintain some sanity last year. Sure. It gives a little break from all the craziness and all the work. I mean, again, I, I actually played drums for many, many years while I was in college and even after college. And I feel people think of, um, software engineering and, and sort of like STEM-based careers as being so rigid. And I'm like, it's all about creativity, man. It's not, it's, you know, I think there's a, find a lot of people that do musicians or artists that get into technology. Oh, yeah. I always want to be creating something, whether it's like a new kind of market, community-driven stuff, building our house, writing songs. Like one of my many mottos is if it's fuzzy, I'm on it. Cool. Do you have any, um, I, I guess, books or conferences, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll include some stuff in the notes, but I just didn't know if somebody was getting into this field of sort of tiny ML or, or edge AI, if there's interesting places that they should look. Well, it's tricky because I learned by osmosis from a lot of stuff. You know, it's not like kind of one outlet. I, I think in general, I mean, obviously you are passionate about this as well as get involved in open source. Open source is a modern way to drive standards. Uh, there's a lot of cool projects. There's some stuff around AI within Linux Nation and, and elsewhere. Um, I think standards are going to be important here. Uh, like Onyx is an interesting uh, open source project within Linux Foundation around how do you standardize frameworks. I mean, there's a lot of conferences and whatnot. I honestly tend to find a number of conferences. I mean, a lot of value, a lot of networking, but then also a lot of rehashing of the same concepts. So getting involved with people that are passionate about it you know it's, there's a bunch of interest groups there's some stuff even on you know like the social media around ai interest groups and just exchanging ideas and things like that you build community 
I think you get a lot further than trying to target some book or some, I mean, not to down on that, but it's all about playing off of each other and, and building a community. It's, I mean, kind of back to music. It's like, how do you get good at, at music? Cause you riff. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, yeah, we, I started a, well, this is conversations on applied AI. So yeah, that's what this podcast was, but we actually have a monthly meetup that we meet the first Thursday of, of every month virtually. So yeah, I definitely encourage people just to, what's interesting now is, is everything's virtual. So like I could attend a meetup on AI in Austin, you know, um, and then, you know, tomorrow night I'll be in Boston. So it's just, there's all these one groups that are going on everywhere. So that's great advice. And maybe or not those people on video will be real. But no, it's been great, like from that standpoint. I mean, I, I worked at home already, Zanita's in California. And so it was kind of a great equalizer for me as people started to realize, oh, this is what it's like to work remotely, like, you know, get a little lonely because you miss the water cooler talk. I think it'll be great to just see people again. I think it's going to get, there's going to be a hybrid. It's not like it's going to go back to normal, as I think we've all been talking about. But we're definitely going to see less of, let me just travel just for this, you know, just to meet somebody for this reason. But it's still good to, go meet people. And of course, real conversations happen over whiskey. So yeah, so we definitely will get back to that a little bit of both. Well, cool. Is there anything else, Jason, that I maybe didn't didn't touch on or that you wanted to end off with? I for sure want you to plug yourself and you know how people should reach out and get a hold of you if, if there's anything, you know, is, is LinkedIn the best place? Are you on Twitter? Or... I should be doing a lot more on Twitter. But I yeah, my my handle speaking of music, former bandmate years ago nicknamed me Def Shepherd. and my last name Shepherd. so uh, I'm at Def Shepherd, playing off the hairband theme but on Twitter and then yeah LinkedIn I, I probably do a lot more on LinkedIn and there's a lot of stuff I've done a number of blogs and panels and podcasts and stuff so if, if there's any interest in my crazy ideas uh, that's why you call yourself CTO is then you have plausible deniability if, if it doesn't happen oh that wasn't on the roadmap that's just but, but this stuff will happen. I mean, this whole thing around trust, it's, it'll take time. But the net message there is don't get locked into some siloed platform today. It may be easy, like easy button. I just grab onto some platform turnkey. Because if you don't start with an open foundation, yes, you want hello world fast, but you also need to start with an open foundation. That's, that's what we're trying to do, for example, from Zadita. If you don't start with an open foundation, you will never get to the promised land, ever. You'll miss out on all that other opportunity. Because if you're trying to, you can drive efficiencies in your business, but there's a floor. If you're trying to drive new business models and experiences, the sky's the limit. So don't try to run yourself into the ground. Think about how do you change the paradigm uh, too. You know, it's not one or the other. It's, it's, but just don't think about zero sum game. Sure. You said everything's better when it's open. So it's kind of like a rising tide lift, lifts all boats, I guess, through these ecosystems. Yeah. One other uh, thing, I know we got to go, but another analogy is, when you get caught in the riptide, most people will, you know, common thinking, gut reaction, I'm going to swim to shore, and then people drown. And so a lot of people think, I just need to do what I do better, and I'm going to swim to shore, I'm just going to get laser focused, and what you're supposed to do is swim sideways. And so we need to be swimming sideways more. Great analogy, Jason, for sure. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to be on the uh, program here, and wish you the best, and for sure we'll definitely keep in touch. Maybe I'll see you uh, next time I get to Austin. Yeah, in, in real person. But the South by Southwest, whenever that opens up again. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, well, thank you so much. All right, take care. Thanks. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.